Welcome back. Welcome back. This this does my heart good. This has done my heart a lot of good as God has spoken and just from last night, remembering just going back and re-establishing that basic having said yes to God and the sense of spending time with God and thinking through sacrificing my life for God and spent a little bit of time last night trying to think spiritually what would it look like for me to kind of get low and get into a good spiritual stance because this one's not going to do any good because I think I just pulled something so spiritually though yeah how, that getting low to have that leverage and strength and stability as God works in and through us and changes our hearts welcome back with me Josh Dosser Good morning. How you guys feeling this morning? You guys fully recovered from last night? I see we still got the stuff waving. Still a little warm. But the, uh, the warmer it is, it's easier to loosen up. Muscles are a little looser. How many people had class this morning? A few people had class. How many people haven't had class yet? Waiting to start your, your day with class? Well, welcome to the start of your day. I'm excited to be with you on day two because I want to really build on what we talked about yesterday. Yesterday we looked at the uh, scripture verse in Ezekiel and uh, we, we started to just kind of build the, the foundation for how we have the heart of God. And we just uh, recapped on kind of what those three things are and this morning I want to talk about what it looks like for us to live out the heart of God on a consistent basis. How do we put what God is doing in our hearts into action. The scripture verse, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says, and these three things will last forever. Anybody know what those three things are? Come on, brother. Faith. Everybody say it together. Hope and love. And the greatest of these is? Love. No, it's got to be faith got to be faith. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's got to be faith. The scripture verse obviously clearly says, as you Grace University, well-educated individuals know, the scripture verse says that love is the most important thing. Jesus was asked in the Bible, what is the greatest commandment? One of the religious leaders came to Jesus and said, hey, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered him. At the time, there was over 600 laws and commands that the Jewish people had to follow and live by. They asked Jesus to break down all those 600 laws and commands into the greatest one, and Jesus gave him an answer as only he could. He said, the greatest commandment is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that you would, help me out, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus did the whole three-in-one thing. He broke down one law into three different parts. And so yesterday, we kind of focused on our love relationship with God. Today, I want to focus on what it looks like for us to live out this idea of love when it comes to other people, when it comes to our culture. After Jesus uh, shared uh, that, the, the, the most important commandment, the religious leader asked Jesus, he said, yeah, but who is my neighbor? Now, this was a religious leader. This was uh, somebody who was considered a pastor, somebody who was considered a theologian, somebody who probably went to Grace University. I think the scripture missed that part, but, but, but let's just for a second say he went to Grace University. Great education knew the laws. The scripture said that he asked this question basically so he could make an excuse for how he was living. He said, so who's my neighbor? So Jesus tells a story. Jesus says there was a Jewish man. Now the religious leader was Jewish. This man that Jesus is talking about is Jewish. He said he, he's going, he's traveling somewhere. Some robbers come, beat him up kick him while he's on the ground, take his clothes, take his stuff, and leave him there to die. They leave and walk away, and, and wouldn't you know it, walking past this guy who's on the ground, the scripture says is a priest. 
is a pastor, is somebody who knows all the religious laws, somebody who actually looks a lot like this Jewish man who's laying there, somebody who's just like him. He, he, he walks by and he looks down at this guy, and what does the scripture say? It says he crosses over and goes to the other side. Then it says a, a temple assistant, somebody who worked right alongside the priest, somebody who also probably went to Grace University, somebody who knew all the laws, sees this individual laying on the ground, beaten, bruised, bloodied, nothing, no clothes, and what does he do? He looks at him and walks on by. He goes to the other side. But then, somebody say but. I like a good but in the middle of a sentence. It says, but a Samaritan, somebody who was anti the Jewish people, a Samaritan, somebody who didn't get along with the guy who was laying down on the ground, who was bloody, who was bruised, who was, had everything taken away. A Samaritan walks by, and what does the Samaritan do? Samaritan helps him up. Samaritan takes him back pays for him to get full uh, uh, care in healing and, and, and medication and whatever he needs. He says, hey, if it costs more, he says, I'm willing to pay for it all. Jesus says, who do you think the neighbor was? They clearly say the Samaritan. Jesus says, go and do likewise. This story illustrates a handful of things, but one of the things I love about this story and one of the things I love about even the picture that Jesus gives us over and over in Scripture is that to love our neighbor means that we have to be incredibly intentional. This Samaritan goes out of his way to love the neighbor that was sitting there. Jesus in the story where there's the woman at the well. Jesus goes out of his way to meet this woman at the well, and even though she was a Samaritan and Jesus was a Jew, they shouldn't have been talking or having conversation. He not only engages her where she's at, but he shows love in such a way that her life and the life of her village is completely changed and transformed. He gives us a picture that love is intentional. It doesn't happen by accident. I'm convinced that every single person in this room has the heart and desire to live a life of love. We all do, that's the reason we're sitting here today. We love God and we wanna live according to his plans and purposes, but I'm also convinced that if we're not intentional and if we're not careful, people won't actually experience or receive the love of Jesus because of the way we're living. I think a lot of churches have great intentions, but we don't create a culture that's consistent with the character of Jesus. Let me tell you a little bit about what I mean, and, and, and if it's okay with you, I want to speak to leaders today. Leaders are people who have influence, and I think every single one of us have influence in some way, and so what I'm going to share today is leadership principles and dynamics. And so I think sometimes as churches, we have great intentions to love on people, but the culture we create in our church actually isn't consistent with the character of Christ. I have a, a friend of mine who's been doing a survey lately, a study. And this study says that he's visiting churches all over our city. And his hope in, in visiting these churches all over our city is he wants to see how churches receive somebody who's brand new. Anybody ever been brand new to a church before? Brand new to a school before? His whole hope is to see. Christians talk about this idea of love. I want to I wanna see if we live it out on a consistent basis on Sunday mornings. And so he's been going to churches for several months now, and, and he's been going to a variety of different churches, and, and, and he said, Josh, you would not believe what I've discovered. He said, I can go into a church of 200, church of 100. I go, I sit in the back, I don't know anybody. I'm sitting in a row where there's people down the row sitting in the same aisle, same seat as me. And I've gone through entire church service experiences from start to finish when I pull in the parking lot to when I leave and get in my car where not one person will say one thing to me. Not one person will smile. 
Not one person will welcome me. Not one person will greet me. Jesus said that they will know you by the love you have one for another. The church, I believe our hearts are to love people, but if we're not intentional, if we don't set up the right cultures, we'll miss out on the very people that God are bringing down our path. We've gotta be incredibly intentional. There was another uh, book, I believe the title of the book, something along the lines of, I think, Chip and Heath or two guys go to church. And on a national level, they did a similar survey as my friend and they had similar experiences. They said many churches weren't welcoming. They weren't loving, they weren't accepting. I don't know if you know this, but Sunday mornings in church is the most segregated day of the week. That should not be the case. If the message we're proclaiming is love and if the lifestyle that we're living and leading is that of love. And so I told my friend who was doing this, this study, he's, he's big in like media and arts and knows how to make cool videos and all that stuff, stuff I have no clue about. And he said, I'm about to make this video and I'm about to expose the church. He's pretty angry and upset. He said, I'm about to, I'm about to expose the church in our city for the way they're acting. I said, hold, 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 hold up, brother. I said, let me tell you something that we've learned. For 27 years, I shared yesterday my We've had a nonprofit organization my dad started and we've been working with pastors and churches and doing a variety of things and, and we've discovered some of the same things but the biggest thing that I've discovered is that I can go to any church and I might have the same experience but I've recognized that's not the heart and intention of the people sitting in those pews. Their heart is that people would feel welcome. Their heart is that people would feel loved. Their heart is that people would feel accepted. But the culture we've created hasn't been consistent to the Christ we serve. And so as leaders, as people of influence, we get the opportunity of creating culture. We get to create culture. How many uh, uh, pastoral, uh, how many individuals are going into pastoral ministry or leadership? Any others in the house? Got a couple of pastoral leaders. At some level, we all play a, a role in, in, in building God's church and in leading God's church. As pastoral leaders, we get the opportunity to create a culture at the church that we lead. If you're a mother, you're at home, you create a culture within your family. If you're a teacher and you're leading a classroom, you create a culture in that environment and everything you do Everything you say, everything you celebrate points to the culture that you're building. And so for the next few minutes, I want to just talk about one cultural aspect that we're building as a church, as a community. And I think it's, it's one of those transferable cultural aspects that if we'll take everywhere we go, people's lives will be changed. And they'll get to experience the love of Jesus in the way that we've intended. Is that all right? Is that cool? So I want to talk about this idea of life lifting. Somebody say life lifting. Life lifting. Somebody say life lifting one more time, but with a little energy. Life lifting. Life lifting. We've got three kind of big cultural uh, values that we build everything around. And one of these values is this value of life lifting. Scripture verse uh, 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 that we'll use, John 10.10, 10, it says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they might have life, and life in all its fullness, and life in all its abundance. As people of love, everywhere we go, we bring life. People should feel, they should see, they should experience life in all its fullness because of who we're connected to. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life. My question is, when people are, are around us, do they experience life? Do they feel built up? 
Do they feel encouraged? Three specific areas that we focus on bringing life as a culture and as an organization. And number one is in our welcome. Somebody say welcome. Welcome. Now, I'm going to talk in the context of, of, of a, a church environment, but this idea of welcome is transferable to every single area of our life. I need like four volunteers. Can I get four volunteers to come up here to the front real fast? I promise I'm not going to have you get into an athletic stance. Four volunteers, just come on up here to the front. Yep, right here. All right, there we go. That's all right. We can have a few extra. Come on up here. All right, I need you guys to come right over here. My man right here. Come on, you in this with us. Okay. What was your name again? Zach. Zach. Nice to meet you. Good girl. to see you, Zach. All right, Zach's right here. Zach is walking in to Grace Church of God. Grace University Church of God, all right? These individuals are a part of Grace Church of God. It's long, long uh, terminology. But you guys are going to welcome Zach. Zach's coming in. He's brand new. He's here for the first time. You guys are going to welcome him, make him feel like he's at home, and, and make him feel like he's not an outsider. Is that cool? All right, here we go. And then we're going to, we're going to call out things that we saw that they did really well. All right, here we go. Zach, let me open the door for you, Zach. Er, you, no problem. Zach's like welcoming them. All right, pause, pause for a second. All right, Zach, back up, back up. Now, again, guys, forgive me. I know this is super elementary. We do this stuff in staff meetings because it's so important to us in creating this type of culture. What are some things that you saw that they did really well? Smile. What else? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yep, the way each person interacted. I love that. What, anything else? Gave their names when they're asking his. Anything else? They went to him. I love that. They bent over, got down on his level. I love that. Let me ask this question. How many people got greeted like Zach did when you walked in this morning? Now, did you guys greet anybody that way this morning when you guys walked in? Great intentions. Great intentions. Obviously, there's capacity to do it. They've got the potential, but it didn't connect with Zach. All right, thank you guys so much. Appreciate it, appreciate it, appreciate it, appreciate it. Thank you guys, thank you guys. Zach, thanks brother. Thanks so much. I was going to have him come up here and, and do it again with other directions, but we'll pause on that right now. If we're not intentional, we won't treat Zach and others the way we actually want to, the way that's in our hearts. And so we've set up some intentional things to help us live it out. Number one, we have what we call the five H's. Somebody say the five H's. Super simple, super practical. We high five. Give somebody a high five who's next to you. We high five. When people come to our church, when I'm at the grocery store, when we're out and about, we high five people. If you watch sports, if you watch any sort of uh, uh, environment where there's interaction, you are high fiving like crazy. Number one, high five. Number two, handshake. Zach got four handshakes. There's something powerful about a simple handshake. People walking, hey, great to see you great to see you. you're looking good high five handshake number three for us heartfelt conversation how you doing guys it's not how you doing <laughs> some of y'all are like oh I'm about to use that one how you doing how's life specifically specifically now again I'm not just talking about on a Sunday morning my family and kids are trying to live these out when we go to the grocery store. 
we'll high five cashiers. You're doing such a great job today. Man, that's awesome. How, you, how, how are you doing today? How's your day going? Good to see you. My five-year-old or six-year-old and four-year-old and three-year-old, we're, we're living these out. Number four is hugs. Now, again, guys to girls, we're talking about side hugs. Not full frontal hugs. It's not a license. But man, who doesn't love just a, a meaningful hug? We got a guy on our staff, Rob Johnson. If you are looking for a hug, he will give you the biggest hug you've ever had in your life. He's a big old bear. And by virtue of being around him, I give better hugs today than ever before. I give more meaningful, more intentional hugs. He hugs people and they, they feel and experience the love of Jesus. High fives, handshake, heartfelt conversation, hugs. And then the last one is a helping hand. So if somebody were to come to our church, hopefully our heart is, man, where, 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 where's the kids area? Hey, come on over here. Let me, let me help you over there. Come with me. We don't just point people in a direction. We actually get down on their level. We help them walk it out. These are our five H's. We go over these with our volunteers every single Sunday when we get together. We do this with our staff all the time. The other thing we have under welcome, the other thing we have under welcome is what we call the three-minute rule. The three-minute rule says that three minutes before church and three minutes after church, you can't talk to anybody you know. Some of your jaws just dropped. Why do we go to church? Well, the hope is that people who are far from Christ are coming to your church. And people who have never engaged in a church service are coming to your church and they are sitting in your seats. And if we're not careful, it is so easy for me to go up to Zach and man, it's good to see you again, Zach. How was your week? Man, your family and, and, and like it's easy to engage with Zach because I know him. It gets a little awkward and a little uncomfortable to go up to somebody I don't know and say, hey, my name is Josh, what's your name? How'd you get connected here? It's uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable for the, the Samaritan to go help the Jew who was, who was hurting and, and he took him all the way back to give him some care and he gave him money that he had. It was uncomfortable. But that's what it takes to help other people feel comfortable and to help them experience the love of Jesus. The reality is it's not about us. It's about how God wants to use us to love on somebody else. See that scripture verse, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these love. When people experience the love of Jesus, they're filled with hope like they've never had before. That hope actually leads them to a place where they say, man, what do you have your faith in? I wanna put my faith in the same thing that you have your faith in. Love leads to hope, and that hope ultimately leads to faith. That's the welcome, three-minute rule. I tell, I tell people at our church, we're launching a new campus in, in a couple of weeks. And I, I told them this this last week when we were talking about these values. I said, I will walk by you after church <laughs> and not say hi to you. Not because I don't love you. But most of the time, I am on a beeline trying to find somebody I've never met before and somebody who might be here for the first time to get to know them. It can happen at church. It happens in our neighborhoods. It happens in our dorm rooms when we say, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go connect with the, 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 the guy or girl down the hall that I've never met before. We can be incredibly intentional about helping people feel welcomed. What time do I need to be done? 11.10. All right, so that means about 11.30ish in my mind. I'm just kidding. Two more though, so welcome. We can be intentional. Our welcome helps people experience the love of Jesus. Number two, our words. Somebody say words. Our words. One of the phrases that we say all the time is we want to uh, think the best, speak the best. Think the best, speak the best. When we live in close proximity with people, we have the opportunity to think thoughts that aren't the best. We have the opportunity to say things that don't build or encourage. I love 1 Corinthians 14. It talks about if you could ask for any spiritual gift, 
all these incredible gifts. Ask for the gift of prophecy. Because what does prophecy do? It encourages, it builds, it strengthens the church. You could right now, this is what I'm going to have you do. You got two minutes. I want you to turn to a person sitting beside you. And you are going to give them a prophetic word. Sounds super spiritual. Some of you are like, ooh, I don't know if I'm on that spiritual level. You're going to give them a prophetic word, which means you're going to share something with them that's going to encourage, that's going to strengthen, and that's going to build them up. You could give them one word, or you could give them a couple of words. Two minutes, I want you to give the person sitting next next to you a prophetic word. And, and, And right now, actually, sorry, we're going to take 15 seconds. I want you to close your eyes. And we're going to invite God to give us a word for them. God, would you give us one word, one one picture, one idea that describes how you feel about the person sitting next to me? Normally that first word, that first thought, that first idea, when it encourages, builds, and strengthens up is from God. Now I want you to turn to the person next to you and I want you to share that word with them. Ready? Go. One minute and 30 seconds. Twenty more seconds, twenty more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. How many of you feel horrible after they shared that word with you? How many of you feel a little, (laughs) one person, how many, how many of you feel a little encouraged? How many of you were even kind of amazed at what they shared with you? I'll tell you what, we did this exercise on Sunday and, and we shared with an individual who basically came out from the streets and, and and came and uh, was curious to what we were doing and just talked about how God had a plan for his life and how there was more. And it just, it lifted him. Who doesn't like an encouraging word? Again, whether it's at church, as teachers, we can speak in a life-lifting way. We can give correction, but we can do it in such a way that actually builds. We build on the bright spots. As a, as a boss in an organization, at the gym, I'm always looking for ways. I'll, I'll walk into the gym in the morning and say, all right, God, who do you want me to give a life-lifting word today to? Who, who, who do you want me to encourage? See, everywhere we go, we're not just going there for our own purposes. We're going there to bring the love of Jesus to the people that are there. And so we're always going there thinking in terms of, I'm not just going to pick up milk for my wife. God, while I'm on this milk journey, there are people who need to experience your love. We can do it through our welcome. We can do it through our words. And the last one, we can do it through our worship. I mean, we can, we can really create this culture, this atmosphere of life lifting by the way we worship. Three things that I wrote down is when we worship, we worship excited. We're excited to have the opportunity to worship Jesus. We, we worship energized. You ever been around people of energy? They just... They just energize you. I heard the other day that, that, that Warren Buffett, anybody know who Warren Buffett is in here? Warren Buffett, one of the wealthiest men in the world, when he looks to hire people, he looks for three specific things. He looks for uh, intelligence, great. He looks for integrity, great. One of the biggest things he looks for is somebody with energy. A life lifter is somebody who brings energy. 
We're engaged in whatever's going on. When I played uh, basketball at Creighton, my college basketball coach brought me into his office one day and he said, Josh, he said, when I, when, I, when I gather the team and I'm talking to you, he said, I need to know that you're with me. I said, what do you mean, coach? I'm with you. I'm here. I do whatever you tell me to do. He said, no, no, Josh, when I'm talking to you, I need to know that you're with me. He said, I need you to give me some verbal cues, some physical cues, nodding your head. He's like, I, I, I not only need to know, but the team needs to know that you're with me. Something happens when you're in conversation and you know somebody's with you. Most of you guys are like, what? Just by the nod of the head says, oh, they're tracking with me. They're engaged in what I'm doing. They're engaged in, and I'm telling you what, there is power and momentum in building a culture where people are with each other. The Bible says wherever two or three are gathered, I love in Acts chapter 2, one of my favorite scenarios, they're in the upper room. They're praying. Holy Spirit comes down in fire. How many people ever prayed that Acts chapter 2 prayer? I know I've prayed, especially the part where 3,000 were added in one day. I'm like, come on, God, do this at our church. 3,000, I want 3,000. My favorite part that, 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 I, that I really... Uh, God revealed to me in that scripture verse at the beginning of the verse it says they were together and in one place did you know you can be in one place and not be together we can have several hundred people here in one place but if we're all thinking about what happened this morning or if we're all thinking about what we're gonna go where we're gonna go next and what we're gonna do we can be all together or we can be in one place but not be together a life lifting culture when we welcome when we worship when we use our words to build people up people feel lifted and encouraged if I had time I'd bring up the musicians and I'd sing a song and this is what I would ask us to do I would ask us all to raise our hands I would ask us all to sing as loud as we can. I would ask us all to not just be in one place, but be together. And I do this a lot with our team. When we pray, I say, I need you to engage with our prayer. So I need you to communicate. I need you to stand up. I need us to participate. The atmosphere changes when we're together and in one place. As leaders, we get the opportunity to create a culture where people can see and experience the love of Jesus, which will fill them with hope and ultimately get them to a place where they'll put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. God, I thank you again for, for this group. I thank you for what you're doing, Lord. I thank you that we can receive your heartbeat, God, but then we can also give your heart away through this expression of love. I pray that we would be intentional. I pray that, God, this would be the thing that marks this school, God, that marks our lives and that marks the movement of your church, that people would know us by the love that we have one for another. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, can I hear a big, that's what's up. That's what's up. Thanks, guys.